Chasing the Rainbows with your host, Bernice Quisenberry. Today's segment of Ask a Maternal Fetal Medicine Doctor is with Dr. Serena Wu, um, MD and fellow of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, is a maternal fetal medicine doctor specialist who um, has experienced her own baby loss. We appreciate her being here and willing to give um, her time to all of us fellow survivors. So thank you so much for doing this, Serena. Thank you, Bernice, for having me and inviting me to be on this segment. I'm very excited and <laughs> uh, feel very blessed to be here with you. Um, little bit about myself. Yes, um, please share with the listeners. I've been a maternal fetal medicine specialist for the last just over 15 years. Um, I landed here in Lancaster Central PA, Lancaster County, for the last coming up on eight years. But before that, um, I've practiced in many different places around the United States. And I think that's important um, in the sense of me being a doctor is that it gives me a lot of different perspectives on the different um, populations of people of who we serve. Absolutely, yes. Oh, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, what are some of the areas of interest that you have with your specialties and, and things like that? Um, so part of being a maternal fetal medicine physician is that we take care of both the mom and the baby, uh, specifically through pregnancy and um, even delivery and after. Um, what makes a pregnancy high risk is uh, anything that is high risk to the mom, baby, or pregnancy. So whether that's a mom that has a lot of medical issues, such right. as high blood pressure or diabetes, or even just age, um, yeah. we take care of moms with those kind of issues. Um, the baby could be high risk, meaning a baby with a genetic condition right. or, um, or born with a, uh, say, a limb dif difference or something that just didn't form correctly. Absolutely. To a pregnancy that has a short cervix, low fluid, um, constant vaginal bleeding. Yes. So those would be considered high risk, and those would be patients um, that would be referred to a maternal fetal medicine specialist. I appreciate you going through that and explaining, um, especially for people like me, um, to hear that and, and what areas, you know, you've seen and um, things that you've, you know, you've been, you've seen and done with your patients. Um, so what's amazing is, is that Serena joined our board of directors at Chasing the Rainbows, which we're so blessed to have her alongside our organization, as you can tell, um, and being a medical professional, um, you know, in the OBGYN world and labor and delivery, maternal fetal medicine, all of that, um, something that I feel, you know, that we have some commonality with is, um, you know, previous um, career of mine was in insurance and, you know, you're seeing people's worst case scenarios playing out every day, you know, with claims like fires, car accidents, it is their worst day of their life when these things are happening and the catastrophes are. And I know that you can relate, you know, where you're seeing those less than 1% cases playing out and all that anxiety. And it, it just creates a whole new dynamic, especially when you were the mother on the other end. Um, and I think, um, you know, you doing this for our listeners and you being present and helping um, other of our fellow survivors um, with getting these answers is just is huge for, for me, for others um, with the processing and the healing. Um, I do, before we get into our story where I'm going to give a five-minute synopsis on what happened in my eyes, and then Serena will kind of um, dive into a, a quick medical synopsis of, and then I have a bunch of questions that I need answers to. Um, there's things around the loss that just don't sit right with me, and I'm the type of griever, I don't know if you can relate or not, Serena, that um, I need these answers. Like, I can't just sit there and, and wallow in the what if or woulda, coulda, shouldas if we can get answers. Right, and um, uh, moms and um, birthing people need right. to know that these answers are valid. Or right. I mean, sorry, these questions are valid. And Correct. that there are no wrong questions and no, um, no wrong answers either. Right, right. And I, th I think it, hearing it from 
you and and other doctors and things like that. It just makes you feel more. Um, I hate to use this term, but uh, like right with your thoughts and feelings. Like these these are valid. These these are okay to have. Um, and I can go and talk about them in a safe space with my provider. So this leads into our disclaimer. Um, we are not giving out medical advice, treating any person, diagnosing any person, all throughout our podcast. This segment is to give that peace for our listeners who are struggling with some questions, but we are um, opening the ability to have that dialogue without feeling judged or silenced around our losses. We are promoting awareness and actual feelings that occur during our losses for a safe space to go and turn to, to talk about those thoughts openly and honest. So for medical advice, treatment, or diagnoses, please consult your primary physician or obstetrician. This is just a safe space for us survivors. Um, did I cover it all? I think? I think so. Yeah. And it's very important to have a safe space. Um, it's very important to feel that you can be open and be able to ask the questions and have a dialogue um, around a very emotional and um, can be very emotionally charged topic as well. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, too, these topics are a little controversial because, um, you know, as a patient, I just want these answers, not for any other reason than just to um, hear them, to get validated, like feel like I'm being heard. And I think sometimes like there's a disconnect like between that because it's hard for us survivors to go back to our OBGYNs after our losses because, you know, it kind of reminds you of that place of where you go back. Right. Right. Exactly. And and then there is some uh, post-traumatic stress absolutely um, going back into walking through the hallways walking back into the office yeah. going into that ultrasound room I mean it, it is it brings back a flood of memories that I think a lot of people don't expect right um, and it opens up feelings that you probably one probably has put away right um, to move on so with you and I opening this dialogue with um, the events that happened around our loss, um, our daughter's name was Brooke, um, I'm going to dive in to just give a, a quick story around what happened, the events, um, and then from there uh, we can get into our, our questions, if that sounds good to you, Serena. So um, the events that, that occurred were um, my husband and I were later in life uh, when we met, and so I was advanced maternal age when we decided that we wanted to have um, a baby together, and I was 35 years old. We were dealing with some secondary infertility. We had acute PCOS, um, uterine fibroids. I had multiple surgeries. Um, so it just caused a lot of scar tissues. So we were, we were having some issues getting pregnant, um, during that time. And then when we were finally pregnant, um, it felt like a dream and it was surreal. Um, and during the pregnancy, um, the early days, um, felt like a dream. And then around 10 weeks, we all of a sudden had some, um, profuse bleeding and I ran into the hospital at the time to get checked. And at that time, they said, okay, it could either be um, that you miscarried a twin or that the placenta was um, implanting and that's what caused all of it and everything looks great, Brooke's healthy, fine, um, kind of ordeal. Um, go home, everything was fine. And then around 27 weeks is when I noticed um, some old blood coming out and it wasn't a lot, it was like quarter size. Um, with only a couple like couple times throughout the day, not nothing alarming, and you know that that can be normal. So I go into my doctor's appointment two days after that that occurred, and um, they sent me over for an ultrasound. Everything looked great, um, fluid was there, um, no issues, no alarms, and we were supposed to have a ultrasound five days later with maternal fetal medicine specialists. Well, we were supposed to cancel that um, because we got already got our ultrasound, but for us, we wanted to selfishly get more pictures. Um, because you know you don't get that during an emergency ultrasound. So we go in for that appointment five days later, and at this point, I knew something was wrong. Like, I, I could sense it. It wasn't like I noticed fluid. I didn't notice anything else coming out. And honestly, the blood stopped. Everything was fine. Everything resumed back. But I just had that gut-wrenching feeling. Um, we walk into that appointment, and the second the doctor walked in with the results, um, he said, you need to be on bed rest in the hospital immediately. Um, so after that, I didn't hear anything. Um, I, well, I did hear that we didn't have fluid anywhere. I was trying to answer questions, but honestly, like it felt like I was in an outer body experience looking down on myself. Um, and then they were walking me, you know, through the hospital to get me into a bed and get me checked and start, you know, with um, antibiotics and, and different things and doing all these tests because we didn't know what was happening.
So after two days of being in the hospital and um, getting tested and, and her heart rate keep tanking at night and me drinking apple juice and orange juice. And despite all of that, the second, you know, we turned 28 weeks um, that day, we delivered her. Um, and when that happened, she was born completely healthy. She just needed to grow more. She only had a CPAP put on her. She didn't need to be innovated or anything like that. Um, and, and that's what she did for the next five and a half weeks until uh, March 16th when we got the call from the doctor, the neonatologist that morning in the hospital saying that she threw up breast milk and her belly was starting to get hard. However, we still were not alarmed or concerned at this point with our medical team just because um, they thought it was from the CPAP, from the oxygen getting pushed into her abdomen because she was presenting as a healthy, strong baby the rest of the time in the NICU. So by the time we got in there, um, just the events around all of it, being in there for those six to eight hours before she passed in my arms, it was um, just a whirlwind of events. And she started crashing. And for 45 minutes, they tried to bring her back. And she ended up dying in my arms. Um, so when that happened, we had a lot of questions that we needed answered. I'm the type of person and griever that needs to, uh, it's better for me to know than to not know. Right. That makes sense, Serena. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I had just some questions to clarify for um, our, our listeners. Absolutely. I um, appreciate that. After your first uh, ultrasound, when you had your first bleed, up until 27 weeks when you had your second bleed. Right. Um, did you have any other ultrasounds in, in, in the meantime? Yes. I had um, the anatomical scan and just various um, check-in ultrasounds just to make sure everything was good. Right. And you had your anatomical scan um, with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Correct. Yeah, okay. we engaged completely with yeah a team. Okay. And that being said, um, I think uh, the anatomical scan is a is an ultrasound done at 18 to 22 weeks. Um, we look at baby from head to toe, and I think because you were advanced maternal age right <laughs> right i know geriatric pregnancy over here i know um I'll that you things. had that yeah. ultrasound with maternal fetal medicine right. um uh but other than that your pregnancy was completely normal nothing with the placenta that they saw nope nothing that they saw um everything was looking great um our pregnant outside of just having that little bit of bleeding at the 10 weeks and then just a little bit presenting on 27 but outside of that pregnancy was great um everything looked great okay Right. Yeah. So your pr pregnancy was otherwise going along normally except for those two bleeds. Absolutely. And um, I also had a previous pregnancy with our son who um, was eight years old at that time or nine years old. Um, and so when he uh, so I've already had a normal pregnancy, didn't have any issues getting pregnant, um, all of those things. Um, and then to go to this extreme was a right. lot different. Yeah. And then what you said, uh, I heard that you heard no fluid around uh, around the baby right um can yes. you tell tell me a little bit more about that can you remember or recall i know it was a whirlwind yes it was it was um but yes um so i didn't notice at all that fluid was leaking out or anything so when i was told that there was um in the quotes like the no fluid um i honestly didn't even know what that meant because i said well my i didn't feel a gush of fluid or i didn't notice any leaking um and who knows you know when you laugh and stuff pregnant and like what you know but um but outside of that like what else you know so when they told me that um I was shocked and and then they you know we needed to check different things um the kidney levels and and all of that to make sure that she was brooke was producing fluid and and do, they had to do all those things right because they so, were worried yeah so one of the things about low fluid around um, a baby um which is in the in the uterus we worry about if you've ruptured your membranes um, okay. ruptured membranes um is uh what we term when the baby who's in a sack and if you think of the sack as being uh, double lined, so if you double bag your groceries, yeah, um, that's kind of my analogy of uh, the groceries or, or whatever's in there is being double bagged. So the membranes around the baby is double double membranes, and the baby's within that sack. Wow. Rupturing the sack means there's now a little hole somewhere in that in that bubble, and that's fluid coming out. But my understanding is that that's not the case here. Right. Yeah. And not that that we were yeah, aware of. Aware of. Yeah. Absolutely. So it was a shock. It was that 
abrupt, unexpected news yeah. we were not expecting at all in that appointment to being put on bed rest. Right. Um, and low fluid around the baby, the other things that we think about is oh, that... Oh, this is great, yeah. Uh, it was the two episodes of bleeding. I mean, it could have led to some chronic bleeding that, and not all bleeding that um, happens in pregnancy can we can we see all of it. Right. You can have a little bit of bleeding in pregnancy, but it's hidden because it's behind the placenta. Um, so we don't see all bleeding, um, and that may have been the case. Right. Um, with the first episode of bleeding, where that started that cycle of um, where the placenta was just slightly detached from the uterus, but not so much so that it was causing harm to the baby because the baby was normally grown via the ultrasounds. We know that right. via the ultrasounds. Yeah. And then the fluid was all normal until all of a sudden that second bleed. <sighs> yeah, and, and see, that's it was so just shocking to us. Right. And right. you explaining it, it just makes sense. And I can actually, like, put it into, you know, into my mind, and it's like, okay, I can process that. Right. Yeah. And so the reason for hospitalizing you right. um, was that low fluid around the baby, A, we need to know why. Um, the number one reason for most fluid, low fluid around the baby is that somewhere, somehow, you've ruptured your membrane somehow. Right, right. Um, and so I know we would have evaluated you for that. Right. The second reason for putting you in the hospital is that if you've done that, um, the likelihood of most women going into labor is... Uh, pretty high. I oh, mean, yeah. So w when you're not at the time where you should be, like 37 weeks and beyond, you we want to prolong your pregnancy. Right. Um, and sense. to do that, um, we know that giving you some antibiotics for a week um, can prolong the pregnancy time frame. Right. We also want to give your baby um, steroids. Um, yeah. to accelerate that lung development. That's right. Because they're not going to be ready if, by any chance, you would have to deliver right. um, prematurely. And and that's what they did because that's why she got the CPAP then instead of the – and they feel like that was a part of it because she had yeah. two days of those steroids. Yeah. So um, – so, Every, and then the other right. thing that we worry about with low fluid is that that fluid around the baby um, does cushion that umbilical cord. Oh, right. So – not only are we watching to see if you go into labor, but we are also watching to see if the umbilical cord gets compressed. Because if it's in a position that um, the heart rate keeps dropping, like you mentioned, um, the umbilical cord is getting compressed is, is one reason, right. could be one reason. And if that's the case, we may have to recommend. I just appreciate getting your point of view on this so much and um, getting better educated on some of these things. And this kind of leads into the next couple questions that I have. Um, it's around our delivery, around it's all OBGYN questions for um, Serena, but these were all valid after we went through our losses. Absolutely. And to be able, I know then that you, that, that after a loss you start, going back and second guessing yes. a lot of your uh, what you did what you were doing that day what you were eating what you were drinking could it could it, you know if you stayed at home and yeah environmental that, yeah right, and could that have made a difference absolutely oh i know and and then like question yeah just question your every like move up until that moment of you know when we were going through what we were um, and it is. And so, you know, my first question was, um, and this is to Serena, did drinking a diet Mountain Dew or a fountain soda during pregnancy erode my placenta and I drank about one or two a week? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah. So the carbonation, CO2, nothing. Okay. No. That wouldn't have done it. Okay. And, and honestly, it made me worry too because of the fake sugar and, and that kind of stuff in diet right. soda. Okay. Um, did my uterine fibroids or ovarian cysts play a role in early delivery or issues? Um, probably not necessarily the ovarian cysts. Um, and it's hard to say. Uterine fibroids can cause issues in pregnancy, right. can cause issues with infertility. Um, they can, um, some of the issues that we do see with fibroids is um, it does divert blood away from, um, can divert blood because it feeds itself right. as they grow during pregnancy. So, but those are fibroids that are significant in size. So I'm talking about five 
six, seven, eight, ten centimeter size fibroids, um, like another baby, so to speak. Oh wow! Um, and that so not just one that's a couple centimeters. Right. Um, also, if you have multiple fibroids, that can also affect. Um, how the pregnancy goes. Um, and so things that we would watch for is how well the baby's growing. Right. Um, and if you, um, another thing that can happen is those fibroids, they run out of its bl blood supply. Right. And they start what we call degenerating. And degenerating just means it starts um, getting smaller and, and they'll go, they, they may or may not go away, but they start getting smaller. Oh. That can cause like preterm labor symptoms and true severe abdominal pain. Now, but you would see those fibroids and the cysts in the ultrasounds and the doctors would be full aware of them and watching them the whole correct. time during pregnancy. So right. there was nothing that was alarming in my ultrasounds, nothing that right. they brought. So right. that's correct. Oh, right. And I guess, wow. Yeah, that kind of answers my, yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, Maria. But it shouldn't um, cause bleeding. Right. So, you know, right. I think for... Oh, yeah, because that's what I, ass I assumed. Like, at first, when the blood started coming out, I assumed it was from a fibroid or cyst because that's what I've seen in past, you know, outside right. of pregnancy. Right. So the fibroids would cause issues with pregnancy, more related to growth of baby, uh, more related to maybe um, abdominal pain and preterm oh, labor, yeah. but not necessarily okay. causing you bleeding. Right. Unless you were in labor. Huh. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah. So, okay. Next question. Did going to a bonfire um, for 30 minutes. Now, I was about 10 to 20 feet away from the fire. I was not breathing the smoke in. I wasn't like direct in it or anything, but it is a fire with wood and heat source. Um, was breathing anything in from trees that were burning or limbs that were burning, um, any fungus from a tree, would that have caused anything? Um, I, I wouldn't. I couldn't speak about the fungus. But. Right. I mean, and was it really even fungus? I mean, I don't know. But, but right. But, but inhaling <laughs> smoke, um, not with the time frame and being the distance. Yeah. That shouldn't. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we moved two weeks prior to um, this abrupt delivery. We thought we were going to have, you know, three months left to get this house ready and stuff. But did me switching environmental changes or being in a new house to new allergens, new everything, could that have caused these issues? Not necessarily. No, it shouldn't. Okay. Unless you knew of a specific teratogen. Right. A specific exposure, which um, none of the more common exposures right. I, w I would be thinking about, like lead. Um, right. Should cause all of a sudden acute change in your placenta. Yeah. Or with baby to cause low fluid right I even went down thinking like was our something wrong with our drinking water or was mm -hmm. something wrong where I was you know because I was inhaling so much water during the day you know drinking those right um yeah the amount of water that you needed to okay yeah it's true though there's environmental questions because it is a change right um so I appreciate that Serena did okay so when we moved in then I did I shampooed with a hand shampooer um a, a one of the ones, it's very lightweight, but it, it looks like a vacuum cleaner. And I shampooed about four of our carpets. Um, would that have caused um, any of my problems, you think? It shouldn't. Okay. No. I mean, if you were work if that was your job and you were doing that daily. I know, right? Maybe yeah. lower fluid. I mean, there is a connection between stress and um, poor um, obstetrical outcomes. Um, it's well known that people with uh, birthing support people uh, birthing mothers yeah. birthing people with high stress jobs um, tend to have lower fluid tend to deliver earlier um, but if it's just one time yeah then should not now is that are you talking about like physical um, or, or, or is that right is that, yeah I you're know. not talking about like emotional stress because like I was told you know with our other pregnancy then I was so stressed that whole time and I worried I was like and it was all emotional mental stress yeah are you talking you're speaking physical with that well I, we are learning more and more about pregnancy right of um, course and there is more of connections with depression uh, maternal mental health that I I can't say for sure that high levels of stress um, does not affect the baby wow, does not yeah. affect the pregnancy but to say definitively in your case, no, right, did, right. was that the reason why uh, the abrupt change? Usually it's not. Usually, okay. uh, you know, it would be something more chronic. 
Yeah, um, and something over like a period of time, like that. Correct. Like you said, like that repeat, repetitive right. motion. Okay. Right. All right. Oh, good. Thanks, Serena. Um, could it have been from taking too many baths? Now, let me also say this. I was very cautious of how hot the temperature of the bath was, but I did enjoy, especially for swollen body parts. You know what I'm talking about. Like getting into a bathtub just hits the spot. Um, um, as long as your bath is not uh, whirlpool temperature. temperature. Yeah. Okay, good. Like like we're talking like 100 or yeah. over. Like Yeah, okay. Like 98 over. Okay. Um, but no, that shouldn't be the case okay all right because i do enjoy my bath um i okay so also it scared me to eat lunch meat just with that um but i eat a lot of lunch meat and salads because that's what i craved but i was worried about listeria all the different you know bacterias um I did try to, I always cooked, I shouldn't say tried, I did um, cook my lunch meat for at least 30 seconds in the microwave, which is not a good idea ever. Um, but, and that's how I eat my hoagies. But um, did doing that to, the, or eating lunch meat, eating salads, anything like that, could that have caused my issues? No. 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 So that it wouldn't have been from like listeria or anything like that. Like, like um, does that make sense? Yes. I'm asking that? Okay. Um, should not. Okay. All right. Um, and also, so before I got pregnant and, and during pregnancy, I was a runner. Um, so I really cut back, though. I only did two to three times a week um, for about two miles each time. However, then I didn't do it in my last pregnancy because it scared me too much. Um, but running is almost like my form of meditation. Would running have caused my placenta? To um, again, running. And if you were a runner and this was something that you did and you continued through the pregnancy shouldn't actually have been shouldn't have caused this right um again uh if you it, it wouldn't have been an acute change is what right. i'm trying to say yeah no i understand that that makes sense absolutely oh <sighs> okay good i am really glad that um we got those questions now the these next set of questions i have are really around um brooke and uh, her loss and the events around her loss and serena and i talked you know the these um we did get answered by a neonatologist already previously but um i am going to ask serena from her point of view as well because you know i can never get enough um opinions about this or enough eyes on our on our daughter's um case so um so when our daughter died, uh, it was found out afterwards through, um, through, through testing and things like that, that she died from neck, which is where, um, if, am I right, where the bowel dies off, right, Correct. Serena? And it's pretty quick and sudden. It happens in adults, babies, you know, at any age. Um, and so I had a lot of questions then because I thought, you know, around the abdomen, that reminds me of digestion. So I was thinking then in my head, I had it that it was because of my breast milk. It's because that's the only thing that she was eating. That's her nutrients and it's going into, um, her, you know, intestines. And so, you know, I asked like, was it something that I ate that went into my breast milk that could have caused this? Um, and I'd like to say that, uh, most likely not, but as I am not a neonatologist, um, I think that the best people to answer would be the, uh, would be not your pediatrician as well as the neonatologist um, that were there taking care of your, uh, taking care of Brooke. Right. Um, that being said, these questions are very, very important. And, right. um, and no question is a dumb question. And I appreciate that, Serena, because I mean, and, and when you're going through it, these all feel and my practical brain just went out the window. It was like any kind of education I've ever had. And, and as you can tell through all of this, like I, I still just can't, um, I can't think practically when it's my own kid, but then when it's someone else, you know, I'm, you, you get it. It's just when it's your own self and you're so close right. to it. Um, but did, so this other question I had was about sucking helium out of a balloon a few days prior with my son, we were doing funny voices and we did like one or two intakes of helium, but then I thought, did helium go into my breast milk and then go into Brooke and cause this? Yeah, most likely not. No, most likely not, yeah. And that's what we were, we were told too. And uh, was this because of an outside virus, germ, allergen, or any kind that I was exposed to that I brought into the NICU on me? And, and again, I, that is very unlikely as well. Right, right. Yeah. Um, was it something that was um, wrong with my milk? Like I left it out too long or like, for example, they tell you, you know, you can only leave your breast milk sit out for three hours. And it, if I left it out for like three and a half or four hours, like would that have caused this? 
probably not. Yeah. Um, and then we added prolacta to our breast milk, which is a human derivative um, added to help with weight gain and things like that. And I was wondering, well, could that have caused it? Because that was added to the breast milk, even though it is a human product. Um, and I'm not familiar with prolacta. Oh, right. Yeah. So let's, yeah. But we did get um, that answered and, and we were told that it wasn't. Um, but uh, Brooke's only precursor to neck was prematurity and then the other reasons like she's only ever had breast milk and, and I'm forgetting the other ones right now but um, even though that's the generic reason is that still the case with neck or has there been more development do you know with it that's still the three reasons right are the, yeah are the most what they would look for right predominantly okay all right thanks Serena um, and I, I think for me like we just want more answers than just like it it all being bundled into prematurity. Like right. if we could break that down a little bit more, boil it down where we could see, okay, well, it could have been this, this, or, you know, it's just for me and that obsession with it, it's, it's good for me to have the answers. Like I said, to be able to process it. Um, is there anything that we could have done to prevent this? That you as parents could have yes. done? I don't think there could have been. Right. I mean, so unfortunately it lands <sighs> down to, and it's hard because that's, not the answer that you're thinking or wanting right. that she was just born a little too early and, and oh i know and uh we only made it to five and a half weeks and then this is the reason right um and it's very unsatisfying it really is because that acceptance it's always like that room for error or you know something that went wrong or you know and you just the woulda coulda shoulda right and and the fact is is that you and your husband were doing everything as parents, Aww. doing the best for your uh, little Brooke. Oh, thanks, Serena. Um, ugh, yeah, I mean, because you do. I mean, it's hard as parents not to beat yourselves up or think, like, could we have done more, advocated more, said something more, you know, and, and you just go through those, all those questions. Um, did I, or we already went through that one. Okay, now this is, this is one, um, you know, that that's something that we have to live with. We don't we don't know because those woulda, coulda, shoulda. But if sending her by helicopter sooner, would or could we have saved her life? And that's sort of looking into the crystal ball. Right. Um, we don't know. We we know the time frame now, but kind of like Monday morning quarterbacking. Exactly. OK, we knew she had, what, six to eight hours after yeah. that? Maybe, but then maybe that wouldn't have been the course if she was in the helicopter. Right. And maybe at that point there was there wasn't anything to send her by helicopter. Right. So not knowing and not being the doctor there at her bedside, yeah. I can't say for sure. Absolutely. Um and who knows what would have happened in the helicopter. Right. So and that's and that's right. And like that's where I go back to. And I think what gives me some peace with it, not that we're ever gonna have hundred percent peace with it, but is knowing that she got to look at me the last time she took her breath and like she got to, you know, be with her mom. Yeah. You know? Um so instead of dying in a helicopter with some strangers, you know? Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. As, and, but with me who's you know were, was with her every day for 10 hours 12 yeah. hours um but I think I think you know like I said that gives me some peace just knowing that um I was the last person that she saw and that you know um but Serena I can't tell you how amazing this has been for me I mean even just to hear more about the medical diagnoses because that's something that I feel like we don't get enough time with our physicians to be able to really talk through all of that during our right. office visits because life is just busy for all of us and we're in and out of doctor's appointments. So I appreciate you being here and doing all of this. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks. And I'm glad we got a chance to talk and uh, talk through some of the things that, w uh, that we are thinking as providers and giving the whys and the hows and the what fours oh, to yeah. why we make those decisions um, or recommendations um, that we we do have you and Brooke in our hearts and mm -hmm. and we do have um, the two of you best interests yes um, 100% I feel that so I mean and no I, I know I speak for myself but I know 
none of my colleagues would ever want to recommend delivery at 28 weeks for anybody. Oh, of course not. Unless yeah. absolutely necessary. Yeah, and I, I can see why now living it, you know? Yeah. Right. Uh, but you just living it every day, you being there, and you being there for the birthing person and being beside them and just, like, you know, being that compassionate provider just means more than you know. Um, and an extension of that is you being here and doing this for the listeners. It just shows how it's nice to have somebody from the inside um, putting a voice behind this and, and cracking that silence for us listeners or, or you know, survivors to get some answers. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, so for our next maternal fetal medicine segment with Serena, please write in on our website at criedoutloudpodcast.com with your story and specific questions so we can hold your Q and a around your loss in a topic specific episode in the future. Also, in our next segment of Brie and B, we need survivors to tell us what they either wish their support system did during their loss or things that their support system did do without even asking them during their loss that was extremely helpful. We are growing and trying to provide a better list of resources for families and would love this. And also, we are going to do a podcast podcast episode in the future for this as well so listeners until next time thank you so much for tuning in and we are always with you fertility pregnancy and baby loss survivors thank you so much serena for being here thank you for having me thank you